by P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> Miss Postlethwaite, the able and vigilant barmaid, had whispered in our ear, Oh, the gentleman sitting over there in the corner, he's an American gentleman. He's come from America. <laughs> from America. He's an American, Mr. Mulliner. We do not often get Americans in the bar parlor of the Angler's Rest. When we do, we welcome them. We make them realize that hands across the sea is no mere phrase. Good evening, sir. I wonder if you would care to join my friend and myself in a little refreshment. Very kind of you, sir. <laughs> Miss Pottlewick, uh, the usual, I understand you are on from the other side of the pond. Do you find our English countryside pleasant? Mm, delightful. But I must say, scarcely to be compared to the scenery of my own state. <laughs> what state is that? California. Mm. California. Ah, the jewel state of the Union. With its azure sea, its noble hills, its eternal sunshine, and its fragrant flowers, California stands alone. Peopled by stalwart men and womenly women. <laughs> All right. If it weren't for the earthquakes. Our uh, guest started as though some venomous snake had bitten him. Earthquakes are absolutely unknown in California. <laughs> what about the one in 1906? That was not an earthquake, that was a fire. An earthquake I always understood. My Uncle William was out there during it, and many a time he has said to me, my boy, it was the San Francisco earthquake that won me a bride. Couldn't have been the earthquake. May have been the fire. Well, I will tell you the story, and you shall judge for yourself. I'll be glad to hear your story about the San Francisco fire. <laughs> My Uncle William was returning from the east at the time. The commercial interests of the Mulners had always been far flung, and he had been over in China looking into the workings of a tea exporting business in which he held a number of shares. It was his intention to get off the boat at San Francisco and cross the continent by rail. He particularly wanted to see the Grand Canyon of Arizona. And when he found Myrtle Banks had for years <laughs> cherished the same desire, it seemed to him so plain a proof that they were twin souls oh. that he decided to offer his hand and heart without delay. <laughs> Miss Banks had been a fellow traveler on the boat all the way from Hong Kong. And the day by day, William Mulliner had fallen more and more deeply in love with her. So on the last day of the voyage, as they were steaming in at the Golden Gate, he proposed. I have never been informed of the exact words which he employed, but no doubt they were eloquent. All the Mulliners had been able speakers, and on such an occasion he would, of course, have extended himself. When at length he finished, it seemed to him that the girl's attitude was distinctly promising. She stood gazing <laughs> over the rail into the water below in a sort of rapt way. Then she turned. Mr. Mulliner, <coughs> I am greatly flattered and honored by what you have just told me. These things happened, you will remember, in the days when girls talked like that. <laughs> heart stood still. He did not like that, and yet. <laughs> is there another? Oh. Well, yes, there is. Mr. Franklin proposed to me this morning. <laughs> I told him I was to offer. There was a silence. <laughs> William was telling himself that he might have been afraid of that bounder Franklin all along. He might have known, he felt, that Desmond Franklin would be a mess. The man was one of those lean, keen, hot-faced, empire-building sort of chaps you find out east. The kind of fellow who stands on deck, chewing his mustache with a faraway look in his eyes, and then, when the girl asks him what he's thinking about, draws a short, quick breath, and says he is sorry to be so absent-minded, but a sunset like that always reminds him of the day when he killed the four pirates with his bare hands and saved dear old Terry Smithers in the nick of time. There is a great glamour about Mr. Franklin. 
we women admire men who do things. You know, a girl cannot help but respect a man who once killed three sharks with a Boy Scout pocket knife. <laughs> so he says. He showed me the pocket knife. <laughs> and on another occasion, he brought down two lions with one shot. William Mulner's heart was heavy, but he struggled on. Very possibly he may have done these things, but surely marriage means more than this. If I were a girl, I would go for a certain steadiness and stability of character. To illustrate what I mean, did you happen to see me win the egg and spoon race at the ship's sports? <laughs> now there, it seems to me, in what I might call microcosm, is a classic example of all the traits a married man most requires. Intense coolness, iron resolution, and Quiet, unassuming courage. A man who has carried an egg around a deck one and a half times with a small spoon is a man who can be trusted. She seems to be. I must think. I must think. S certainly, you you will let me see something of you at the hotel a after we have landed. Oh, of course. And well, if I need to say, what whatever happens. I shall always look upon you as a dear, dear friend. Yes. Three <laughs> days. Uncle oh. William's stay in San Francisco was as pleasant as could reasonably be expected. Considering that Desmond Franklin was also stopping at his and Miss Banks Hotel, he contrived to get the girl to himself to quite a satisfactory extent. And they spent many happy hours together in the Golden Gate Park and at the cliff house, watching the seals basking on the rocks. But on the evening of the third day, the blow fell. Mr. Mulliner, I want to tell you something. That anything, except that you're going to marry that parish of Franklin. But that is exactly what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and I must not let you call him a perisher. Well, he, he's very brave, and he's a very intrepid man. When did you decide on this rash act? Well, scarcely an hour ago. We were talking in the garden, and somehow <coughs> we got onto the subject of rhinoceroses. He then told me that how he had once been chased up a tree by a rhinoceros in Africa, and he escaped by throwing pepper into the, to the brute's eyes. He was most fortunately chanced to be eating his lunch. When the animal arrived and he'd had a hard-boiled egg and the pepper pot in his hands. And when I heard this story, oh, like Desdemona, oh, I loved him. The danger that he had passed. Well, he loved me that I did pity them. The wedding is to be in June. William Bolliner ground his teeth in a sudden excess of jealous rage. Personally, I consider the story you have just related about this man, Franklin, to reveal him in a very dubious, I might almost say sinister light. The leading character on his, the leading trait in his character on his own showing appears to be cruelty to animals. <laughs> and the fellow seems totally incapable without, the fellow seems totally incapable of encountering a shark, rhinoceros, or any other of our dumb friends without instantly going out of his way to inflict bodily injury upon him. I do not wish to be indelicate, but I cannot refrain from pointing out that if your union is blessed, your children will probably be the sort of children who kick cats and tie tin cans to dogs' tails. <laughs> Take my advice. You will write the man a letter saying you are sorry that you've changed your mind. I do not require your advice, Mr. Mulliner, and I have not changed my mind. Instantly, William Mulliner was all contrition. There is a certain stage in the progress of a man's love when he feels like curling up in a ball and making little bleeding noises because the object of his affection so much as looks wide at him. And this stage my Uncle William had reached. He followed her as she paced proudly away through the hotel lobby and stammered incoherent apologies, but Myrtle Banks was absent. Leave me, Mr. Mulliner. She said, pointing at the revolving door that led into the street. You have maligned a better man than yourself, and I wish to have nothing more to do with you. Go! William went, as directed, 
and so great was the confusion of his mind that he got stuck in the revolving door and had gone around in it no fewer than eleven times before the hall porter came to extricate him. <laughs> well, I would have removed you from the machinery earlier, sir, said the hall porter deferentially, having deposited him safely in the street. But my bet with my maid in there called for ten laughs. I, I waited till you had completed eleven so that there should be no argument. William looked at him instead. Hall porter. Sir, tell me, hall porter. Suppose the only girl you had ever loved had gone and got engaged to another. What, what would you do? The hall porter considered. Well, let me get this right. The proposition is that if I followed you correctly, what would I do, supposing the Jane on whom I'd always looked on as a steady mama had handed me the old skimmer and told me to take all the air I needed because she'd gotten another sweetie? Precisely. The question is easily answered. I'd go around the corner and I'd get me a nice stiff drink at Mike's place. A, a drink? Yes, sir, a nice stiff one. A, where did you say? Mike's place, sir, just around the corner. You can't miss it. William thanked him and walked away. The man's words had started a new and in many ways interesting train of thought. Drink? I stiff one? There might be something in it. William Mulliner had never tasted alcohol in his life. <laughs> he had promised his late mother that he would not do so until he was either 21 or 41. He could never remember which. <laughs> At present 29, but wishing to be on the safe side in case he had got his figures wrong, he had remained a teetotaler. But now, as he walked listlessly along the streets towards the corner, it seemed to him that his mother, in the special circumstances, could not reasonably object if he took a slight snort. He raised his eyes to heaven, and as though to ask her if a couple of quick ones might not be permitted, and he fancied that a faint, far-off voice whispered, Go! <laughs> At this moment, he found himself standing outside a brightly lighted saloon. For an instant, he hesitated, and then, as a twinge of anguish in the region of his broken heart reminded him of the necessity for immediate remedies, he pushed open the swinging doors and he went in. The principal features of the cheerful, brightly lit room in which he found himself was a long counter, at which were standing a number of the citizenry each with an elbow on the woodwork and a foot upon the neat brass rail which ran below. Behind the counter appeared the upper section of one of the most benevolent and kindly looking men that William had ever seen. He had a large, smooth face and he wore a white coat and he eyed William as he advanced with a sort of reverent joy. Is this Mike's place? Yes, sir. Uh, are you Mike? No, sir, but I am his representative, and have full authority to act on his behalf. What can I have a pleasure of doing for you? Well, the man's whole attitude made him seem so like a large-hearted older brother that William felt no diffidence about confiding in him. He placed an elbow on the counter and a foot on the rail, and he spoke with a sob in his voice. Suppose the only girl you had ever loved it gone and got engaged to another. What in your view best meets the cake? The gentlemanly bartender pondered for some moments. <laughs> well, I advance it, and you understand as a purely personal opinion, and I shall not be the least offended if you decide not to act upon it. But my suggestion, for what it's worth, is that you try a dynamite duel. Well, one of the crowd that had gathered sympathetically round shook his head. He was a charming man with a black eye who had shaved on the preceding Thursday. Much better, give him a Dreamland special. And a second man in a sweater and a cloth cap had yet another theory. You can't beat an undertaker's joy. They were all so perfectly delightful and appeared to have his interests so unselfishly in heart that William could not bring himself to choose between them. He solved the problem in diplomatic fashion by playing no favorites. He said, I'll have all three. And the effect was instantaneous and gratifying. As he drained the first glass, it seemed to him that a torchlight
life recession of whose existence he had never been aware, had begun to march down his throat and explore the recesses of his stomach. And his second glass, though slightly too heavy, enlarged with molten lava, was extremely palatable. And it helped the torch life procession along by adding it to a brass band of singular power and sweetness and charm. <laughs> And with the third, somebody began to touch off fireworks inside his head. Whoop! 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 Straight rye, and that's what he said, sir. Yeah, straight rye. But is your brother Elma, is he a man whose opinion you should be, his example should be followed? Should he be trusted? He owned the biggest duck farm in southern Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone, a duck who owned half Illinois, I should certainly follow that example. <coughs> Oblige me by telling, asking these gentlemen what they would like and start pouring. <laughs> well, the bartender obeyed, and William, having tried a pint or two of the strange liquid just to see if he liked it, found that he did, and ordered some, and then he began to move about among his friends, patting one on the shoulder, <laughs> slapping another affably on the back, and asking a third what his Christian name was. <laughs> I want you all, he said, climbing onto the countertop. <laughs> Cut his voice to carry better. Come and stay with me in England. Uh, 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 oh, never uh, uh, in my life have I met men whose faces I like uh, so much. <laughs> More like brothers than anything is the way I regard you. So you just pack up a few things and come on and set up with me for a few weeks as long as you can manage. You particularly, my dear old chap, he said to the bartender. <laughs> Thanks. What did you say? I said that. <laughs> said, I pardon you, gentlemen, to witness that I have just been grossly insulted by this man who just grossly insulted me. I am not a quarrelsome man. If anybody wants a row, they can have it comes to being cursed and sworn at by an ugly bounder in a white coat, it's time to take steps. <laughs> Those spirited words, William Mulliner sprang from the counter, grasped the other by the throat, and bit him sharply on his right ear. <laughs> <laughs> there was a confused interval during which somebody attached himself to William's collar and his waistcoat and the seat of William's trousers, and then a sense of swift movement and a rush of <laughs> <laughs> William discovered that he was seated on the pavement outside the saloon. And a hand emerged from the swing door and threw his hat out. And he was alone with the night and his meditations. <laughs> well, there were, as you may suppose, of a singularly bitter nature, sorrow and disillusionment wrapped William Mulliner like a physical pain, that his friends inside there, in spite of the fact that he'd been all sweetness and light and had not done a thing to them, should have thrown him out into the hard street that was the saddest thing that he'd ever heard of. He heaved himself to his feet and placing one foot with definite delicacy okay. in front of the other, and then drawing the other one up and placing it with infinite delicacy in front of that, he began to walk back to his hotel. Uh, At the corner, he paused, and there were some railings on his right. He clung to them, and he rested a while. Now, the railings to which William Mulliner had attached himself belonged to a brownstone house of the kind that seemed destined from the first moment of its building to receive guests. 
both resident and transient, at a moderate weekly rental. It was, in fact, as he could have discovered, had he been clear-sighted enough to read the card <laughs> over the door, Mrs. Beulah O'Brien's theatrical boarding house, a home from home, no checks cashed. And this means you. But William was not in the best of shape for reading cards. A sort of mist had obscured the world, and he was finding it difficult to keep his eyes open. And presently, his chin wedged into the railings. He fell into a dreamless sleep. He was awakened by a light flashing in his eyes, and opening them, saw that a window opposite where he was standing had become brightly illumined. His slumbers had cleared his vision, and he was able to observe that the room into which he was looking was a dining room. And the long table was set for the evening meal, and to William, as he gazed the sight of that cozy apartment and the gaslight falling on the knives and forks and spoons, seemed the most pathetic and poignant that he had ever beheld. A mood of the most extreme sentimentality now had him in its grip. What could compare when you come down to it with a little home? Oh, a man with a little home is all right. Whereas a man without a little home is just a bit of flotsam on the ocean of life. Oh, if Myrtle Banks had considered to marry me, I would have a little home, but she's rejected me. Now I'll never have a little home. What Myrtle Banks wants is a good swift clout on the side of the head. That <laughs> pleased him. He was feeling physically perfect again now, and seemed to have shaken off completely the slight inner position from which he had been suffering. His legs had lost their tendency to to act independently of the rest of his body, and his head felt clear, and he had a sense of overwhelming strength. If ever, in short, there was a moment when he could administer that cloud on the side of the head to Myrtle Banks as it should be administered, that moment was now. He was at the point of moving off to find her and teach her what it meant to stop a man like himself from having a little home when someone entered the room into which he was looking, and he paused to make a further inspection. The new arrival was a maid servant. She staggered to the head of the table beneath the weight of a large tree containing, so William suspected, hash. A moment later, a stout woman with bright golden hair came in and sat down opposite him. And the instinct to watch other people eat is one of the most deeply implanted in the human bosom, and William lingered intent. There was, he told himself, no need to hurry. He knew what 